All right. Um, it says we are streaming live. All right. So I'm going to take it that we are. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Heart Mind Happy Hour. I am extremely excited today to have um, special guest, neurofeedback therapist, specialist, um, Heather Hargraves. Welcome, Heather. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. It's really great to have you here. Um, so for those who don't know, this is a show that I do. I am your host, Holly Copeland. I am a Human Potential Institute um, certified coach, and I run the HeartMind um, Alchemy Project website and just really interested in consciousness, um, neurofeedback, brainwaves, this whole world of technology, psychedelics and consciousness and meditation and um, love to see the conversations that are going on there. And then I'm doing these um, interviews to bring kind of a live element to that to that Facebook group. And so you're a perfect fit for this group because this is exactly your world. <laughs> yeah. It's starting to happen. I, I got invited to uh, the Awaken Future Summit and they put me in the Technodelics group and they were like, you may be the one person here who's actually been looking at the intersection of mindfulness, psychedelics and technology as like your actual career. And I'm like, yes, it's so nice to be over here with other people interested. I, I tend to run around at some of the psychedelic conferences going, hey guys, guys, if we, if we put them together, <laughs> this could be really cool stuff that can happen, but it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I love, um, so just for, to put a little bit more picture, you're, um, you, you did your research in this area of consciousness mm -hmm. and psychedelics. I love your description on one of your videos that's on YouTube of being a brain DJ. I yeah, I dropped the alpha bridge that comes from a uh, Malin at Imperial. We were joking around and she said that and I laughed so hard. I was like, I'm using that from now on. <laughs> <laughs> brain DJ Heather Hargraves. It's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and one of those videos, which it, when we get into the meat of the conversation, um, I, I do actually love your description of, of the different brain waves as being related to like a choir. So yeah, that's so cool that you, I'm always like, which metaphor sticks with which person I've just like got a whole bunch of them. And then I'm like, does this one fit? Does this one fit? And then when it clicks, I'm like, okay, good. <laughs> yeah, we've got insight relationship and understanding now. Yeah, that one was brilliant. There's a, for folks who don't know, there's a YouTube video. I'll post a link to it at the end of the show uh, where Heather goes in deep in this analogy and it's a beautiful analogy. So um, yeah. it's great. And then your dental analogy is another one that cracked yeah. me up. <laughs> one, two. Feedback's like flossing the brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just, what I notice and what those, those videos and your communication style, I think you're just really eloquent at, at helping people understand these concepts and putting these brilliant analogies that completely make sense. You do that really, really well. Working as a clinician day in, day out, you know, I was seeing 25 to 30 people a week and trying to explain neurofeedback to them over the past five years. You know, I came into it a little technologically heavy and then realized I needed to soften and start coming in with metaphors. And some of them were even collaborative with clients, you know, giving me feedback and then just developing these insights together. So I'm really grateful for my work because I think it's helped me actually do what I do with more grace and finesse. So it's the relationships I've had have also helped me grow. grow. Yes. yes. Well, I definitely see it and it's a huge asset. I love that you're a part of this heart mind community and other, this world, you're, you bring so much. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you for that. Um, well, you tell a wonderful story of how, some of how you got into this research in a personal experience. And maybe that's a good place to start to just describe what okay. happened to you and uh, how you got into this work. Um, so I would say that, well, as a teenager, I was super uh, mischievous. I, somebody took me to a rave once and I discovered rave culture. And I remember the very first time someone gave me some MDMA and it was the first time I had danced and I had these like beautiful heart opening experiences. And then I just dove headfirst into that lifestyle and into that culture. Um, but then I decided after some time I wanted to go back to school. I wasn't sure what I was gonna do. 
I went back to school and four months later, I was in a car accident. Mm. And this car accident was, it almost took my life. So we were making a left-hand turn and I recall looking out the window and just seeing headlights and a car drove directly basically into my hip. So that crushed me to about mm, four inches or so. My mom said that when she saw the car after, she just couldn't believe where I was even sitting. Uh, my memories are quite dissociative. And interestingly, if it comes up or we go there today, it, my journey through medicine work has actually brought some of those dissociative body states back to me. Uh, some of them actually quite recently even. And some of it even came with holotropic breath work, which I found pretty profound. But my actual memory is being completely calm, not knowing what was going on and just looking over and noticing the jaws of life inches from my face and then seeing a paramedic and being like, okay, you got to help me out of here. Um, so as I recovered from that, I spent about seven years with chronic pain. And when I went back to school, I was in communication studies and English and I you know what I was doing. I'd almost died. And I took a philosophy class and I became absolutely fascinated with philosophy because of course now existentialism was exactly what I wanted to understand. And I started to get really interested in epistemology and theories of knowing. And hilariously, my favorite class ever in school was mind design and Android epistemology, which <laughs> now- Mind design and Android- and Android epistemology, epistemology. <laughs> yeah. <That's the> class. <laughs> By far my favorite class. Um, and hilariously, like when I look back, it's one of those things uh, Mendelbrot, who you know, developed or labeled the Mendelbrot set, he has a quote where he talks about, you know, I thought my life was just a series of random things but when I look back, I could see the patterns. And I'm finding that, you know, we're just clearly drawn to things, but it's been interesting to see how these patterns have overlapped to bring me where I am today. Um, shortly after graduating, I lost my brother in a car accident. And that I was still, even though I was doing well and I finished school, I was still struggling with chronic pain. And then having to go through the experience of, you know, telling my parents and then actually identifying his body, which they did not prepare us for at all, created a really severe dissociation in me. I, I recall the moment sitting in front of him and like literally leaving my body. And it took me the better part of two years to get back. Like, wow. and I just kept thinking, I feel like my brain has been rewired. Like what happened to this? Like fun, loving, go out, talk to everybody, like want to party and dance and enjoy. And like, you know, I'm in philosophy classes, talking with people and debating all these topics. And then I was absolutely mute, like mortified. I couldn't talk to people anymore. I was having regular panic attacks. I didn't feel like I belonged in my body anymore. And I felt generally lost. Um, so I ended up finding a really good therapist who definitely changed my life. And I'm eternally grateful for all the help she has given me over the years. Um, and through that, I gained a lot of insight. She got me to re-socialize myself by reading to a blind man and petting cats at the Humane Society. Um, and I actually use this metaphor a lot now with clients where it's like, you know, you just have to kind of slowly re-socialize your system after it's been shocked. Um, and then I got into yoga and meditation and I, over time, opened a yoga studio, mm -hmm. but I found a lot of people would come to my classes and cry and their therapists were sending them to me and saying, go do yoga. And I was like, I, I don't know what to do. And I'd run into a few snake oil salesmen on my own along the way. And I, I didn't want to be doing that. So I decided to go back to school and study psychology and as I went back and I wanted to study meditation, people like, you want to study consciousness? And I was like, I, okay. So that journey led me actually to a trauma lab that was looking into neurofeedback and was also looking into dissociative states. So I was interested in the neurofeedback because I had somebody give a talk in one of my second year counseling courses where she was a neurofeedback therapist. And I remember just being like glued to every word she said <laughs> after she left, I like, hounded her with a million questions because it was the first time someone had said you can rewire your brain and I was like oh I can turn it back and yoga and meditation had really helped me a lot mm -hmm. 
but I felt like I still had like this dragon in the corner that I had learned to take care of, but he would still breathe fire on me from time to time. So I was still wary of him. But when I got into the lab, I first started as like an EEG tech helping master students. And then when I did my own uh, research, which was psychedelic informed neurofeedback, um, I really started noticing it was changing the way I was feeling. And it started feeling like the dragon was slowly dissipating. And then from there, we started noticing the overlap with psychedelics, dissociation, meditation, and that was kind of like the birth of where I am now. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, great. I thank you for, yeah, giving that context. It's really interesting to hear. And um, it adds a lot of depth and personal experience to, you know, to what, what you're bringing, by the way, you've got kind of, um, that light that's coming in the window is creating like a bright spot on your cheek. Bright spot. Let's yeah. see if I can like back it up a bit. How's you that? Want to back? That's better. Yeah. <laughs> I'm cool. shining. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was sort of an odd effect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm sorry about your brother. It sounds like you've been through a ton. It was quite the journey. And in many ways, you know, I've taken that and the fact that I still have a life and I know he would want me to live it fully. So I guess I feel like part of my mission is like, because I feel like I've kind of figured out how to step back into myself, mm -hmm. helping others how to step back into themselves after a traumatic experience or even just general life stress, like yeah. learning how to be a little more resilient and adaptive. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um... And so the research that you did, I think maybe uh, describing a little bit about some of the research you did, I um, noted, and if I got this correct, when I was watching um, one of your talks, it sounds like, you know, you had some main findings, for, there's a lot of people who watch this, um, uh, you know, who are in the Heart Mind Project group that are tracking their brain waves mm -hmm. um, and seeing those trends. And, you know, something in the own, in my own tracking that I did over the last year was notice, for example, you know, theta going up overall and um, alpha going up overall and decreases in um, delta, for example, mm -hmm. um, overall. So, so some interesting trends just in sort of personal biohacking uh, using, you know, a really simple device using the Muse. And when I watched the results of your video, um, sounds like you saw some of those trends as well. Um, so I'd love to hear you talk about some of the effects in the brain that you saw um, in your research and, and then move into gamma, which is a little more complicated. And, uh, yeah. and <laughs> so essentially my research was born out of, there's a traditional neurofeedback protocol. So most of the people in this group may be familiar with it known as alpha theta. And it's kind of one of the first and still mostly used, uh, deep states protocols. And it targets a lot of the parietal regions, which are tied to our sense of self and the default mode network. And often I'll look at like the alpha frequency in general, as a neurofeedback therapist, we're really interested in the posterior dominant rhythm. And this was part of my choir metaphor where the posterior dominant rhythm is the rhythm section of the brain. So you have eight to 12 Hertz, and we always want to identify where does someone idle on that scale. The slower the brain goes, the closer, like so more eight or nine, sometimes even down into seven, there's likely a learning disability or they're heavily dissociative in some way. However, there so, could also be some shamanic capacity there. there. That would be their peak, like their peak, their peak frequency. Peak yeah. frequency, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then if the peak frequency is, you know, 10 being the average and what kind of looking for, um, 11 to 12, and I've even seen up to 13 means speed of processing, sometimes predictive modeling or rigidity. So this is a little more loose and this is a little more rigid. And then we look at how that kind of goes with everything else. So in alpha theta, it was first believed that it was how many times they crossed, like how many times alpha went up or theta went up and alpha went down. Um, a researcher, a postdoc at my lab looked at these findings and actually found that it was how many times alpha had been reduced that was leading to the positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. So then our lab started studying squashing, which is just an inhibit, a global inhibit, well, of the alpha frequency at the percunus, so PZ of eight to 12. 
And for dissociation, we noticed that like pulling that down, it created this rebound effect in the brain, much like psychedelics do. Um, and so it would awaken individuals who'd been in a bit of a dissociative state. However, sometimes this could be a little bit like shoving them off the cliff and it could be a very overwhelming experience. And as a neurofeedback practitioner, I do use it, but sometimes I find it a little abrasive. Um, then we started looking at psychedelics and noticed that actually it was like a one to 20 Hertz reduction that seemed to be leading to some of these positive effects and outcomes. So that's really what I started doing my thesis on was just what happens if we just squash a much broader frequency. So individuals would then- What do you mean squash a broader frequency? So I would inhibit, mm -hmm. I would reward the quieting of everything from 20 Hertz down. Oh, so you're actually trying to reduce the overall um, power of the, yeah. the signal. Yeah? Yes, okay. exactly. And so from those findings we would, or when I would do that, individuals would start expressing when we looked at like an altered state scale, they had very similar responses as individuals under like psilocybin and MDMA, particularly with like dissociation of self and audiovisual synesthesia, we would see, there's my son, okay. increased theta, which means they're kind of going into this more of a trance state, a little more of a present state, you know, flow states are like embodied, but effortless, which is where mm -hmm. that gamma kind of comes in. Mm -hmm. um, so, and we would also see different coherence patterns. It would depend on, I think as I've done this more, I try to get away from being too particular about what I would see as an average, because as I've worked with individuals, I've learned that it depends on where you're starting. And so then people start trying to mimic the research completely without paying attention to where they're starting. And what's important about that is if you've got a slower brain frequency and someone's got a faster, you know, PDR, those are different starting points. It's like being a tall person and a short person. Well, this person needs to duck and this person needs a ladder. And then I have to understand why are you trying to alter anything? Like, what is the goal of that? You know, if you're a really flexible person, then yeah, you want to gain some strength. So you go to the gym and do weights. But if you're already like a really stiff person, you probably go to yoga and try to balance yourself out. Mm -hmm. So I think that you can see certain patterns, but sometimes that's not what's norm or what's good for you. And then we get fixated on, well, this is what I saw. So then I want to achieve that. But the second you're trying to achieve something, you've lost your relationship with yourself. <laughs> yeah gets back to those essential buddhist principles too of surrender yeah. and not striving and not uh, yeah and all that good juicy stuff right <laughs> and that talks that gets into like randy's comment yeah which we had talked about you know where was it dan brown mm -hmm. says yeah. that all of these devices and tech and everything like that are distractions yeah. they're distractions if you look at them as solutions and if you look at them as it's going to fix me it's i'm more interested in why are you seeking this tool why are you, what are you seeking to develop a deeper relationship with? And how is that tool going to help you with the relationship? And when I first started with neurofeedback, you know, I'd sit someone down and I'd beep, beep, beep them. And I'm like, these are the protocols and oh, this, this hemisphere is going too fast. So we're going to slow it down. But I would find that clients would, they would develop something called blowback. So it's actually relaxation induced anxiety, or I would act so like calm them down. And then they're like, when they speed back up or I'd speed them up and it would be too overwhelming and they would have to come back down. So I've learned that it's actually, what's the underlying narrative or relationship that drove you into that pattern in the first place? And then how can we use this tool to help you have a new relationship to help you find a place where you feel more regulated? So in many ways, I would say what my thesis research has taught me is that tinkering with the back of your head is a lot about equanimity. And, and this is a lot what we do at the Neuromeditation Institute too, is that the quiet mind protocols are teaching you to surrender, which is like a Zen or a transcendental state. And the back of the head, this reducing valve is really like, how much information am I taking in and trying to control with sense of self? And how much can I be equanimous and find a state of like active surrender and know when to fully surrender and when to engage self? 
Mm. And so it's, I've learned that it's more about what did the, what's it teaching you as opposed to it achieved these brain waves and now I've got perfect synchrony and perfect coherence patterns. And I got more theta and less Delta. Like some meditators actually create more Delta. They get deep into those brainstem states. And so you do see Delta popping through. Yeah. And I've seen that actually in certain, yeah, as I've moved through and dissected the data. Yeah, yeah it absolutely comes up. Um, but it, okay, so the equanimity would be a glo- kind of across the board would be a global goal. And I think a lot of people would say like a flow state, you yeah. know, living in, you know, living in kind of spontaneous joy and happiness and gratitude, not that bad things couldn't happen. And you would kind of, you know, yeah, obviously you adjust to that and are empathetic and compassionate to some situation, but that you're, so that's another piece is the empathy right? and compassion is a separate network. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, they're so, all connected. Yeah. Right. But that, uh, that network is online appropriately when yeah. it needs to be right. You're pulling that compassion and empathy in yeah. appropriately. You're mm-hmm. sort of living from a basically joyful, yeah. you know, you can release to open up enough yeah. or you can hone focus yeah. when you need it. Easeful, yeah. joyful, graceful state of being. Well, so it doesn't everybody want that. I mean, I understand that you're saying like, we don't know how we want to shape the brain, but could you not make the generalization that most people are yes. going through that and they're starting from different places? A hundred percent. And this is why I think when I found Jeff at the Neuromeditation Institute, he really um, helped me understand, because I'd done my undergrad thesis, I didn't talk about this too, looking at six different types of meditation. And we were developing something called the mindfulness breath attention score. So I would bring someone in, I would give them a certain meditation and then we would have these bell intervals that they would listen to during the meditation. So a bell would go off and they'd have their hand on a keyboard. And if they were paying attention to their meditation, they would click yes, like why? And if they had been mind wandering, they would click no, because I think those were easy to toggle. And we realized that there's so many like trait measures of mindfulness, but not enough state or any state measures of mindfulness. And the goal was to look at these, so they're about 15 minute meditations. We would have equal intervals, intervals of five minutes or no, five bells at equal intervals or 10 bells. So we looked at frequency and then we actually looked at intermittent bell cycles <laughs> across different mental health measures. And what did we find? We found that usually guided meditations in the beginning were the most helpful for keep, keeping people on task. And that the more ruminative or anxious they were, the less like support you gave them, the harder it was for them to stay on task. So it's like, we slowly need to like gate attention. Yeah. And this is where the neuro meditations are great because it's like, we're specifically looking at core pillars of attention and self that then help you surrender and trust that these pillars are in place so that you can enter flow. Yeah. Oh, fascinating. And meditative traditions argue over this is the tradition and this is the tradition and this is the tradition. But the more we look at it, and mind you, we're really only looking at stillness, right? There's a lot to be said about, and we'll get into the polyphasic, like dance and movement and drumming and like active patterns um, that I think are still need to be explored on some level. Um, but that how, when we get those pillars in place, it can just make things more clear for you. So it's not about, or so the meditation practices will argue amongst them, but you kind of need them all. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You need to, if I could generalize, like you need to learn how to stabilize attention. You need to learn how to rest in open awareness. You need to learn how to cultivate loving kindness. Right. Uh, And, and whatever the other one, quiet your mind, quiet your mind. Yeah. the equanimity. And so I think sometimes individuals are drawn to particular meditations because they bring a balance to their nervous system. And then that becomes the like, this is it. And it's well, but yeah, like people become yogis and like, this is it. Mm-hmm. People become muscle people. And this is it. That's it for you. And at stages in your life, it may change. Like we know that the alpha frequency, for example, slows as we age. And so some people with mental health uh, challenges will actually feel better as they get older because things slow down. But then now you need something else. So with the meditation, I'll hear people be like, this worked for me for so long and now it's not working anymore. 
I'm like, yeah, because you, you need to be meeting the moment and being able to have that sensitivity and to know how to flow with it. Yeah. Or to ask the question of what could I try that's a little bit different as opposed to these tools answer my things. Yeah. <laughs> fix my problem. Yeah. Have you spent much time uh, studying uh, or looking at Mahamudra and Zojan and the, you know, those, that tradition from Tibet in the uh, effortless awareness um, world? Not completely, no, but effortless awareness would make a lot of sense to me. And I know some of the, I've heard stories of some Tibetan monks who think our obsession with dropping the DMN is quite funny because they're just like, yeah, that's just a state. <laughs> <laughs> you let that go, you do some house cleaning. Um, one way I had another neurofeedback practitioner describe it to me is like your DMN is like monkey bars. And then all of your kind of like thoughts and fears and different things are like monkeys on the monkey bars. And then if you have like a, an effortless awareness or a dropping of the DMN or psychedelics can drop the DMN, it's like the monkeys fall off and then the bars come back and you're like, ah, I'm free of the monkeys. But if you don't clean up the monkeys, <laughs> They slowly climb back on and sometimes the monkeys actually get better at holding on. And before you know it, you've like infused aspects of like defense mechanisms and control with your DMN and it can be, become very hard to unstick. Yeah. Some may say this may be what's going on in some personality disorders like narcissism. Yeah, I think I, I'm sort of off-roading here, but I think it would, the analogy would be that you just become aware of the monkeys in this tradition. You're, you know, you, you're observing them. You're, you are aware and, yeah. and accepting and then accepting. And then you just choose what you need to choose. I find that that's a place. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of when the pillars are in place, then yeah, that's easy to do. Mm -hmm. If you know how to focus when needed, let go when needed, be equanimous with what's going on, but be sitting in this felt sense of presence mm -hmm. that keeps your overall nervous system grounded because your body and mind don't know the difference between a thought and reality. So we spend a lot of time engaged in thoughts as if they were real. And then the nervous system becomes very activated and then we lose our ability to shift our focus or to be equanimous when we're yeah. upset. And more the brain becomes literal teflon for the good and velcro for the bad in that state and so then our biases get reinforced which makes us look for them more <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah so the so, effortless state is actually quite protective yeah as well mm -hmm. yeah um I would love to hear you talk a little bit about you were the first person to introduce me to monophasic and polyphasic cultures and some yeah. of like wonderful insights from that and shifting kind of how we as a humanity, you know, I, I would, maybe it's fair to say sort of mm -hmm. shifting to a more polyphasic culture from this yeah. monophasic Western culture. Can you talk a little bit about that and um, how that? Yeah. So I recommend uh, Tara Lumpkin is the author of this one paper. Uh, Michael Winkleman calls it the integrative model of consciousness. And if you look at Dr. Yellowbird, it's a lot to do with actual neurodecolonization. So they're all saying similar things, but with different lenses. But with the monophasic and polyphasic, if we're going to use that one, monophasic is just using normal waking consciousness to inform yourself. So it's only what happens. It's concrete, kind of reductionist, and it's just whatever happens, dreams are random things that occur and we leave it at that. Whereas, but we know that that's usually desynchronized fast frequency activation in the front prefrontal, the left. And so it's more of a sympathetically charged state. And I think it's fair to say that most of us, particularly during COVID are more sympathetically charged, right? Everything changed, we don't know. And interestingly, there's like three major assumptions that underlie uh, PTSD and that kind of need to be addressed for someone to experience post-traumatic growth, which is the assumption that the world is fair, that if, you know, good things happen to good people, um, that there's certainty, that if I do A plus B, I'll get C, and that if something bad happens to me, I must have deserved it. I definitely, and so then you get this self of like, shame, it's my fault, something's wrong. But these are also common thought processes when we're in a sympathetically charged state. And so 
the more we're in this monophasic state, the more likely we're going to end up in a rigid thought pattern that when the world breaks it, we fragment and get overwhelmed and end up showing these PTSD symptoms. In a polyphasic state, we welcome the monophasic. That's super important, right? That's an aspect of consciousness, but it tends to be like when we talked about the brain DJ and dropping the alpha bridge. Well, the alpha bridge is really the bridge between conscious and subconscious. And so a polyphasic mind is just a mind that has become attuned to the subconscious states as well. So it knows how to go into these theta and delta states, which tend to be more symbolic, uh, imagery based. There's um, divination, looking at patterns, understanding uh, resonance and uh, dream work is really popular as well. And, you know, deep shamans and mediumship, like individuals who can maybe just see like the, the fractal pattern around someone based on how they're actually using their consciousness at that moment. Not that there couldn't be changed, but that, hey, I can read your resonance, I think. And I've heard it said that a lot of like mandalas and fractal patterns are actually more tied with the feminine energy. So the more watery energy, energy, the more flow energy. And when you have that ability to kind of submit and observe as well as attend and, you know, do, you're going to have a little more flexibility and you're less likely to get caught in these belief structures that are so easily broken when the world shows you that, hey, there's no certainty. Doesn't matter what kind of person you've been, things happen. And then it's more about what are you going to do with it? Like, how can you play with the overall interface? So in some ways, it's like this infinity loop, right? You need to have the bottom and the top and it's kind of radiating through the heart or um, the posterior dominant rhythm, which is like 50% the autonomic nervous system and then 50% cortex. So it's like, how is consciousness being pulled in any given moment? And so some people can drown in the depths and some people can get overwhelmed in the highs. And so you, you kind of want to be able to move between. And when I work with people with neuromeditation and in general with neurofeedback, it's often what I'm finding is I'm like, ah, you've just been locked over here too long. <laughs> it's cool you idle there, fine. But can you come down here and explore it and not live in avoidance of it? Or can you come up here and explore it and not live in avoidance of that? Cool, you idle there, but you want to have the flexibility to go and encompass your full uh, capacity of consciousness, I guess. It's oh. a little more of a protective mm -hmm. um, mode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so in this in this kind of framework, I guess, which sounds to me like, um, I mean, it sounds like we could, we, you could make an argument that like, if we could teach the world to move in a polyphasic mind to, for people to cultivate polyphasic minds, all the things you just described in a flexible mind that's adaptive, that honors dream work. Effortless awareness. What's that? It's very effortless awareness. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it very much is. It, it's yeah. just a, a different framework, I think, for describing a lot of things that I've seen in the effortless awareness yeah. movement and the Tibetan teachings and, you know. Mm -hmm. It's um, just being in tune too, like mm -hmm. subtle enough in yourself and humble enough in yourself that you can truly feel the other without predicting or controlling or like ruminating. You could feel a tree, you know. She talks about, you know, is polyphasic awareness for global survival. Like the thrust yeah. of her article as an anthropologist is actually, we need to globally shift into this if we actually want to reconnect with the planet and kind of work back to dealing with climate change and biodiversity and a lot of the atrocities that are going on in the world. Because when we're heavily connected and collaborative, it's much harder to right. ignore those things. Yeah, absolutely. And in the in these practices I was talking about, the Zojana Mahamudra traditions, there's mm -hmm. very much an, a practice of bringing your awareness, you know, stretching your awareness out into a tree, yeah. like or when anything, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, but you are, you, yeah, you are becoming, you are realizing yeah. 
that okay. your awareness is a part of all of this. And it's, a, and it's then, very much a self-realization process. Exactly. And then we have individuals, you know, if we look at uh, Janira Nuremberg and her like neurodiversity project and her book, Divergent Mind, she talks about how individuals who have high sensitivity, so um, the highly sensitive among us, high sensory processing, autism and ADHD are actually individuals who kind of already exist that way. And they're so overwhelmed by the level of disconnection that maybe they're canaries in the coal mine and we've been pathologizing them as dysregulated, but actually <laughs> their, their dysregulation is indicating how, uh, you know, they can't sit, they could naturally sit effortless awareness. They might actually have been the shamans and the medicine men in traditional cultures. They are the individuals who are the healers and the helpers, but their systems are so overwhelmed because <laughs> we're so disconnected. Oh, that's and it's kind of a flip. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we've been hypnotized into pathologizing healthy responses to an unhealthy system. Wow. <laughs> that's that. You just sort of blew my mind. <laughs> Her book blew my mind. It really started linking these things together. And I'm like, you know, I, there might be another way, you know, even individuals working in the Hearing Voices Network and with psychosis and different pieces of that, you know, like, I was just going to say, I have a schizophrenic brother. I mean, and to think about, you know, him hearing voices and to think about not pathologizing that, but actually that's like tapping into a level of awareness. Mm -hmm. Hadn't considered that before. And yeah. yeah. And so, just like there's, you know, real big athletes among us who are these really divergent athletes, there are still people who do are born without an arm or they are born with like a bent spine and None of that is bad, but we need to accommodate for that. And so there's this spectrum of consciousness as well that I think really reflects our physical beings, tall people, short people, like what are the, and so schizophrenia, I think exists on a dimension too, or some are maybe more connected that way, or some may actually have some confused networks and like, how do we tease those apart? I don't know, Right. but it's an interesting thing to consider. <laughs> Very interesting thing to consider. And then, yeah. the, you know, you and I talked a, le a little bit before we started about the feminine aspect of this mm -hmm. polyphasic culture and, yeah. um, the, you know, uh, goddess worship. And, you know, if you get back into the literature on that, we've, we've kind of lost the divine feminine, which is more connected with the water and nature and earth and care. And when we really think about the fact that like in traditional cultures, this belief of seven years forward and seven years back, and we actually look at epigenetics, it's, it's true. Like it's a real thing. And a woman who has a fetus, it's a four month old fetus in her stomach. If I was pregnant right now with a four month old little fetus, that fetus would have all the eggs that she'll ever carry in her. So she, that fetus would live inside of me for the next few months and experience, you know, that synergy between me and this baby. And then that baby would be born and those eggs would go through her whole life until she's ready. And so these experiences, it, until we really truly start nourishing women's nervous systems, we are not going to get out of this traumatization cycle because babies will continue being born vigilant and ready for stress. We know that babies are born ready for whatever it is their mother went through and her mother went through and her mother went through. So it's not just about, you know, feminism. It's actually about science and epigenetics and knowing that we need to care for the feminine aspects of our culture because that's what is producing the future generations. Amen. <laughs> yes, I, couldn't, I could not agree with you more. Absolutely. Yeah. And I guess the hopeful optimistic piece is that this, you know, all of this work that's being done, the type of work you're doing, the people doing the polyphasic culture work, the people doing mm -hmm. effortless awareness and luminous awareness. I mean, it's all bringing yeah. that divine feminine recognition of that into yeah. human, you know, consciousness. So exactly. And we can come back now to Dan Brown's comment. Yeah. Sure. It's a distraction, but we don't live in a world where we're super connected anymore. We, we live in a world where we need to remember how to connect. And so is technology a complete distraction or is it a way of helping us remember? And if we're using it as a means of calming our nervous system and helping us remember our relationship with ourselves and others, 
then maybe it's a gateway. And I actually, you know, I, I have a supervisor named Seaburn Fisher, who I highly recommend. She is probably one of the most influential uh, neurofeedback therapists when it comes to trauma. And I'm endlessly grateful for the tutelage I've gotten from her. I joke that I've been classically trained where I've been really lucky because of the program I was in to sit with some really wonderful supervisors and she's one of them. And she did work with Thich Nhat Hanh following his stroke. Um, because he was really struggling and having a lot of nightmares. She shared this in a group once. And when she started working with him, she found that these nightmares and different dysregulations he was experiencing started to come. And so then his assistant started learning neurofeedback. All of Plum Village is now learning neurofeedback. And Thich Nhat Hanh said that neurofeedback is a Dharma door. It's a new Dharma door. It's a new way of seeing into self. And so it's a distraction if you're looking at it as a solution, but it's a mirror if you're looking at it as a means of gaining a deeper relationship with yourself. And so I think that's the emphasis. And even with psychedelics, it's like, how is this helping you relate to yourself more? And where may it be that you need to deepen your relationship with self? Like where may the kink be? And it's not bad. It's just something you kind of want to undo or unknot. Yeah. Yeah. We, there's a lot of ideas that this is bad. I need to fix it. Nothing about you is bad. It's actually usually very adaptive. It's just that it's no longer adaptive because it needed to become so fixed in that super monophasic, you know, rigid state in order for you to cope in a very rigid monophasic world. Right. Yeah. I mean, it sort of reminds me of that wonderful Rumi quote, like everything you need is already inside of you, you know, the universe. So like you're sort of, to me, it's like, you're holding two simultaneous ideas. You're holding the idea that basically we don't need anything more than what we already have. Everything is right here. And at the same time, most of us need some help discovering that <laughs> except for the, all, it's all through relationship, right? Yeah. And, and our world is flat screens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there are these wonderful tools, be it um, neurofeedback or some of the technology headbands coming out on the market yeah. or we're using or psychedelics that can help us make these breakthroughs mm -hmm. and, and used not dependent, not as a solution, yeah. not as the answer, but as a tool yeah. to self-realize. And if on can, your journey, it's on your journey. If you can do that <laughs> artfully and you can be wise about it, it can be really helpful. And yeah. you can also know that somewhere you actually didn't need any of it. Fine. I can hold both those ideas at the same time. Yeah. That doesn't bother me. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually, you know, eventually someone goes to the gym and they use the machines at first to make sure they got proper form. And then they move to free weights. And next thing you know, they're climbing mountains. Like it's just whatever you need at that time, it's not right or wrong, but it's understanding that that's gonna, you know, keep you a little more linear to one thing than the diversity of running around in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta have the strength to run around in the woods. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and running around in the woods can be a little confusing and you can get off on, you know, yeah. actually wasn't that helpful or, yeah. you know. Exactly, With totally, yeah. <laughs> Training wheels, it's training wheels. Training, I, I like that. And I talk to people about that in my own practice about you know guided meditations and so they're training wheels. And yeah. you know, most of us need training wheels. I need training wheels. I mean, I'd say yeah. nothing wrong with it. <laughs> oh, no, but you just have to see that it's a training wheel. Right. And that eventually you're gonna let that wheel go. You yeah. know, it's not a thing that's gonna fix it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's your engagement with it and the effort and time you put into it that eventually gets you to a place where the wheels taught you something. Yeah. Okay. So speaking of training wheels, I would say that as a biohacker, you know, person who's yeah. interested in all these different training wheel tools, it can be a little confusing out there in the marketplace trying to figure out what training yes. wheels to use. So would you talk a little bit about some of those tools? Yeah. Be it, um, you know, something like David Delight or, you know, the Muse, um, you know, some of the other ones, neuro, neuro rhythm that people were just talking about? Yeah, I haven't. I haven't used NeuroRhythm, but I've actually used ABE with David Delight quite extensively. Um, I've had many clients like 
get their hands on it. And actually we find that between the neuro sessions, it actually just helps maintain flexibility because it's all about entrainment, right? So when you're in training, you're being encouraged to develop a relationship that's unlike the relationship you're used to having all the time. So by getting opportunities to shift your relation, relational states, I guess, it's the same as like you start rocking people out of their ruts. Or if I've rocked them out of a rut with neurofeedback, then it keeps them from getting back into the rut because now there's still variety happening. So, yeah. and you know, it depends on what someone needs, but the David Delight Pro has a ton of frequencies that you can play with. And I just encourage people to really sit with it. What's feeling right for you. And then when I'm working with people therapeutically, it's, is it uncomfortable because you're growing? Like you got to run a marathon and the winded feeling is you're going to come against that. That's uncomfortable. And you kind of have to progressively overload yourself into more cardio mm -hmm. or is it uncomfortable because it's actually not good for you and it's too much for your system. And that can be a really tricky balance point to find. So if there's a lot of emotional things going on, I recommend a clinician so you can have that relational piece and you can talk about it and work it through and have the reflection. But for the most part, it just keeps you from getting too stuck. Um, neuro rhythm looks really interesting. Uh, I have a friend who's been playing with it and says that he's noticed some change. He's like an EEG expert, but I haven't got a, a full report from him. Mm -hmm. Muse is generally good for calming. We know that it kind of raises alpha, but sitting still and focusing on something raises alpha as well. So it's a really good tool. I used it in the university all the time. Um, we were prescribing them to students just to get them to sit and focus on something other than their thoughts. So it yep. encourages that open mindfulness, which will naturally calm down stress in the body. Which a lot of people need, right? A lot of people need. I And they have sold a lot of devices, you know, and that's great if it's helping people get to a still place. Yeah, definitely. What if, um, and I'm thinking specifically of David Delight, but I think actually NeuroRhythm has this ability too. What if you're more in the, uh, I, mean, I fall in this category, you know, looking for, I, I'm saying this a little, knowing that looking for a flow state is something we're supposed to surrender, but you know, you're trying to get, I understand it's that trying to get to that, you know, gamma sort of high, heightened consciousness yeah uh, gamma was something like david delight is that something you've done or your clients have done to, for i've done performance enhancement almost so i have a pulsed electromagnetic field that i use and i will we, we called it when i was at a psychedelic conference in prague we called it the prog cocktail so i would like squash the dmn and then i would like give them gamma on the frontal left and people were like Woo! I feel great. I'm so activated. I take the PEMF with me when I go to Europe because it helps with my jet lag. So I'll give myself a little gamma boost in the front left. Sometimes I go midline, but I, that can be a little, you get really excited with that one. I don't mind, but I caution others against. Um, so I would say, yeah, like in that entrainment can really wake you up or calm you down. It's mostly frontal driving. We know we want the left side of the brain to be going a little bit faster than the right, which means you've got your top down processing. And then we hope there's the polyphasic, you know, everything's kind of flowing through. Um, there's, there's a new one that's coming yeah. up. What's the Pardon? one? What's the device you just mentioned? Oh, so I have, it's a Neurofield X3000. It's a pulsed electromagnetic field. So it goes with rhythm is too, right? It's Pulsed PEMF. Is it? Okay. So that's really, I don't know. I thought it was like a TDCS. I don't even know. I think it's a pulsed electromagnetic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So then it would be nice for entrainment. It's really good for uh, inflammation reduction. Okay. The one I have has like a million settings on it. I, I tend to use it for the gut. So there's, you know, the unexplored space in our microbiome, which has been demonstrated with when we're using alpha theta protocols for individuals who had addiction histories, uh, the researchers found that they weren't quite breaking through with people and they couldn't figure out why. And then they realized it was because there was just so much inflammation in the body that if you only have, you know, 10 guys to kind of, they're also the firefighters and the construction workers, but they're down here putting out a fire or anywhere in the body, really, I can call them up and they'll change things. But then the client within a day will go right back. And so when a client can't stick, 
I know that it's an inflammation issue. So that's why I got the PEMF. So I put it on people's abdomens usually. Okay. Is this a pad? Like a pad, like random? There are pads you can get. I actually have coils specific for coils. So I can place them either on the head or on the gut or people, okay. my clients who are in car accidents will put it on their neck sometimes. It just depends. It's pretty uh, diverse and fun. This is like an electromagnet. It reduces inflammation through pulsed elect electromagnetic fields. Through a field. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. You do have to be careful with it. I did learn once I could turn off people's short-term memory and then had to turn it back on. That was, <laughs> that was a learning curve. My supervisor was like, try this. My client's like, I don't remember anything. I was like, uh oh. <laughs> so oh. I was like, come on back in. And he was like, we'll turn that back on. And I was like, that's insane. I just yeah. like turned off their ability to remember. I was like, holy crap, but you can turn yeah. it back on apparently. So you, you gotta be careful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I wonder too. I am a bit I'm a big fan of um, infrared uh, saunas. I have one that helped me. Yes. Yeah, so the Violite is really really cool. Violite for Alzheimer's and uh, concussions and cognitive decline has been showing a lot of promise. Okay. Um, I've tried the Violite. I felt like my head was in a balloon. I did the gamma frequency, and I was like, Whoa, "This is fun." <laughs> I'm at the conference, just like <laughs> bubble head. I don't know how else to describe it. <laughs> Uh, so those they're all worth trying and there's a new one that's come out I don't remember what it's called but it's FNIRS so I actually have um where we look at blood perfusion it's known as HAG and I just got one of those devices so when somebody's been in this vigilant state for a long time or this monophasic state sometimes they've lost the ability to truly turn on the prefrontal cortex so trauma and concussion will do this also so HAG measures blood perfusion in the prefrontal. So it's like literally cardio for your frontal lobe. And so you actually, one of the hardest things to clear is someone who has excessive theta in the front because they're asleep. And to get them to wake up, you got to get through their predictive biases that keep them asleep. So when you're doing a game or something that's actually measuring blood flow, it wakes them up without it needing to be a cognitive task. It becomes okay. more of like a engagement that way. It's cool. Oh, that's very cool. And it's called the HAG? Yeah, a hag. I forget what the one. There is a consumer device that has come out that I'm actually quite interested in. The new, uh, the new one that measures blood flow. Um, I was trying to think of the name of that one, and I'm just. I don't, but it looks really promising. I think yeah. that can be really helpful for concussions and trauma histories. I would, or I would recommend someone with a trauma history have a clinician when you start waking up your frontal lobe. You want someone there to relate to. I mean, that could be also somebody with ADHD, right? Anybody who's got sort of low. Oh, yep. Yeah. Totally. Data. Yeah, it'll increase focus. It would totally be a peak performance device, I think. Yeah. Could it also be for somebody who was an aging senior who yes. wanted to wake up their brain? Yeah. 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 Better than Sudoku <laughs> in some ways. Yeah. And Sudoku is good, but some of they found, or better than um, what were those games that everyone was playing, which was just a bunch of like, you know, a cognitive battery. Yeah. That they found someone at my um, university was, Adrian Owen was like, no, it's not doing anything. <laughs> what about the VR world? Do, do you do much in that? World? Yeah, so I work with Helium. Yeah, uh, We're using the Brain Link right now, which is really great. Um, VR in and of itself, like everything we've talked about, moving into these polyphasic surrender, effortless awareness states. Well, if you just put a thing on your head and you're suddenly brought to this beautiful place that you can surrender to being to that place, your nervous system is going to calm down. And they've Jeff has totally proven and shown that anxiety comes down. He's got some studies published on that. Uh, but if someone's not comfortable with putting VR, they also have augmented reality that you can use with your phone and you can have it interface with the neurofeedback, just mostly frontal training right now. Yeah. Or you can just do it on its own. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I, I'm really interested to try BrainLink and yeah, yeah, as what, what the world needs is a much better interface right now. Like we're kind of still trying to find the headset that will be the thing that interfaces with all these devices. Because once we can, I think there'll be a lot of click, click, click. And then we can start layering and stacking the way I do as a clinician. But, you know, you got to come in. I got all this big computer. I got all this stuff <laughs> that it's not easy to lug around. Yeah. So it's, it's still limited right now. Yeah. And I think really sort of the breakthrough in 
you know, all these, it's really democratizing these so that people could use them yeah. you know, uh, in their homes without needing to access a lot of clinicians or getting exactly. basic support um, mm-hmm. or just working with a coach, somebody like me remotely. Totally. You know, um, can you say anything? I know you've sort of, you're in this field of looking at other devices and yeah. some may be in development. Can you say anything about any of that work? There, there may be something in development. <laughs> Stay tuned this fall to see. Okay. Um, we're, we'll, we'll see. But yes, there is something in development and I'm not the only one. Yep. There are a few people looking into some cool stuff and I really hope to collaborate with everyone because I think that, that that's the only way to move forward. We yeah. each have something unique to offer and it's when we share and relate and grow together that we'll really be able to do something special. Uh, I completely agree. And getting to scale, getting to, you know, where we're, yeah. I mean, the world, obviously people need these, this help tremendously. Very much so. And I think that's what's inspiring a lot of people right now in the community to try to make these things more accessible. And, you know, just recognizing I'm, I'm really inspired by Tristan Harris's work and this idea of that the way we've been using technology is downgrading, you know, human consciousness. And that one of the ways he said for us to move forward is to nurture awareness. And I think that's an area where I really like to work. So it's like being a midwife of consciousness and how do we develop technology that nurtures our relationship with ourself as opposed to technology that just makes us more tense and intense and staring and just like you know, our attention is a commodity to be bought and sold instead of seeing it as like really truly the core of what drives so much of our sense of self and that it needs to be reflected, especially yeah. for young children. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And, you know, that really, to me, brings me right back to the conversation about polyphasic, like nurturing technology, that's feminine tech, not feminizing this technology, making yeah. sure it's in there, you know? Yeah. So, it's just, yeah. we need both, right? You can go to so many different, you know, Shashuma and Ada and Pingala and like in yoga and like the weaving, like we, we need the whole thing, the whole spectrum not just the beta frequencies. You need theta and delta and low alpha too. And flow, when I really think about it, I've been imagining like nesting dolls, you know, our, our early sense of self and delta frequencies drive the brainstem and are really automatic fight, flight, freeze processes. So that's doll number one. And then theta frequencies and everything are kind of supported around that through childhood and up into teenage years. And that's our emotional relation self. And that's, you know, little doll number two. And then the alpha frequency is kind of set around 12. So those dolls now are set together. And if a child didn't have, they're stuck in fight or flight, or if they're stuck in a neediness or shame, those dolls remain separate. And then this like overarching ego has to somehow make sense of those divisions. And then that creates like this, tension or dissociation to just avoid but a flow state is really when the dolls unify you know you don't need separation anymore you can really be at one with everything early on until later but sometimes that even means being in relationship with generations of pain i've had some clients come in and i'm like just what is what is it and then we go back into their grandmother and we see there was war or there was abuse or something had happened there and how that's resonated into like the very basis of who they were and they've taken that on as this is my identity, but it's actually just, you've carried that forward, that stress. And so as you develop that relationship, even beyond yourself, integration and relationship can happen. So now we have this rich understanding of self, which is theta, and this like true alignment, which is gamma, because there's no fragments and you can just be at peace with yourself and you can have effortless awareness because you're comfortable in your entire history and with who you are, not that you're not growing and changing, but yeah. Oh, that's another uh, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful analogy. And it actually reminds me of something that I had wanted to ask you about in one of your talks, you talked about alpha and theta wrapped in gamma. You'd sort of describe Yeah. It. So they talk about like, and I, you know, the, my technical edge is not super strong, but there's, I remember a supervisor telling me, if you really want to understand an altered state, you need to understand wavelets and you need to understand how it's actually like, yeah, like these envelopes of 
um, I'm actually just understanding this even deeper right now. <laughs> this understanding of the theta and the alpha wrapped in the gamma, which is basically, I think, what I just said. It is. But he had said that to me years ago, and I remember being like, what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> looking up wavelets and I'm like, oh no, too much math. <laughs> so we have alpha and theta synchronized across the brain. And th that's clearly an important part of this mm -hmm. sort of synchronization. And then wrapped in this kind of whole brain, as Dan Brown likes to say, awake means awake. Yeah. Gamma brain. Yeah. I see gamma is like, you know, it's got a, when the car has got a really nice hum because everything's finely attuned and nothing's out of order. So that would be like the dolls aren't knocking up against each other. There's, there's an awareness and acceptance and a relationship with all layers yeah. so that you can surrender or activate. Yeah. And idle what feels good for you. <laughs> and, and, and in unity, which is yes. the other piece we talked about, which is yeah. basically that's kind of unity consciousness, right? Yeah. In ourselves and then mm -hmm. through to the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, I'm aware that it's 603 and I'm sure you have things to do. <laughs> I could talk to you for hours because you're so knowledgeable and brilliant and fun to talk to. And I just so Thank appreciate you. you coming on. Thank you so much. Thank you for asking me. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I just deeply appreciate it too. And uh, look forward to more. And maybe if um, a device that might come out sometime, maybe in the future, maybe you might want to come on again and talk about it if that were to happen. Maybe, I think okay. so. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> well, <laughs> just sort of let the universe unfold and see what happens yeah. and stay Perfect. in touch. Yes, 100%. <laughs> All right, thank you so, so much. Thank, um, you. thank you to everybody who has been watching. Really appreciate all the support and positive feedback I've been getting on this show. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I will put some show notes about um, Heather, but Heather, how, if people want to be in touch with you, what's the best way to reach out to you? Um, so my email is nmi.nspyrl at gmail.com. Okay. I'm on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. So okay. <laughs> right. I'll, put, I'll put a contact for you in the show notes as well. Perfect. Um, and or the Neuro Meditation Institute yeah. through there as well. They have contact yep. forms. Yep. Yeah, and just to be transparent, I'm working with Heather in the Neuro Meditation Institute I'm a, as a student, and uh, well, hopefully someday we'll be offering that as a coach uh, in the work that I do. So if anybody's interested in uh, in some of the performance coaching that I do, feel free to reach out to me at heartmindalchemy.com. And um, yeah, I will just, it's a really, this is such an exciting world. It's really fun to be a part it's of. It's fun. It's like a big playground. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. An adult <laughs> playground for people who are yeah. fascinated by consciousness. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And really just if really I maybe I'll leave it here for the benefit of all beings, you know, that we 100% are to help everyone out there. Um so in honor of that, um we'll say goodbye. Thank you again. Thank you everybody. Thank you. For